All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we're going to continue our look at the Bhikkhuni Vaga, the section on the nuns. Last week, I introduced you to a very short section of the Samyutta Nikaya, and this is the section on the bhikkhunis, a section on the nuns. And there are 10 very short sutras, and they each figure, or they are about uh, each about a different nun. And as we learned last week, all 10 of these poems, they're all sort of the similar format, which is that Mara, the evil one, has come to the forest to sort of try to intimidate or scare or cajole the various nuns. And we did three of those poems or three of those sutras last time. And so we're gonna continue. And our first one tonight will be the bhikkhuni named uh, Vijaya, uh, whose name means victorious. Um, and that's going to be on page 224 of the Wisdom Publication Edition, if you happen to have it. Otherwise, uh, we have a link to Sutta Central that has translations of all of the Bhikkhuni Suttas. And um, yeah, and so you'll be able to find Vijaya and Upalavanya and all the different nuns that we're going to look at tonight. So you can kind of follow along there if you'd like. Um, one thing to mention from to to start off with, though. So, first of all, I really like these sutras. <laughs> I find these sutras. I'm so excited that we we all have discovered this section. And what I guess I wanted to share with you to start with is, so I I wanted to make it clearer that you know we. We use, or I use, these collections of sutras. And by these, I mean the Nikayas. And there is the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha. There's the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. There's the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses. The Anguttara Nikaya, the enumerated discourses. and. What I want to mention is, so you, if you've watched it or you were there, a number of weeks ago, I was up in San Francisco and I gave a kind of a workshop, a kind of extended Dharma doors. And we looked at just one small sutra, also from the Samyutta Nikaya. And I chose that sutra because our good friend Noe pointed it out to me. And I thought, wow, this that's an excellent sutra. But then when I started doing my research on that sutra, the Katyayana Sutra, I realized, oh, this sutra, meaning the Katyachana or Katyayana Sutta, Nagarjuna references that little sutra in his Mula Madhyamaka Kataka as like a foundational text for the middle path for, for the Madhyamaka. And what I wanted to make clear is this. So these particular collections of sutras, like the way that they are grouped, the ordering of them, all of that is, is representative of the Theravada Buddhist tradition. And what, what I'm kind of getting at is, or, or actually, let me just get around to what I want to get around to. You or somebody may be inclined to take these 10 beautiful sutras concerning the bhikkhunis. You or even I'm inclined I'm inclined to just take these 10 sutras and basically make them my Buddhist Bible. <laughs> like this is all I need. Are these, these are some 10 excellent sutras 
I think I'm going to base my whole, I, I'm, by the way, I'm not, but I'm just saying, you could be inclined to just say, you know what? I think all the Dharma is right here in these 10 sutras by these 10 nuns. I'm going to make this the foundation of my practice. And let's say I did that. Like, let's say I, Michael, did that. And then some of you out there were like, well, I want to study the Bhikkhuni Suttas as well. And I said, sure, come on over. Let's do it. And if we started a little group around the Bhikkhuni Suttas, who knows? That might turn into a little school or a little sect of our own. And what I want you to know is that that's how Buddhism has functioned throughout history. <laughs> different groups all over the place have chosen different sutras that, for whatever reason, they worked. They worked for that community. And so, for example, you might already be aware that the Zen or Chan Buddhist tradition in China really gravitated towards the Vajra Sutra, the Pranya Paramita Vajra Sutra, or the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. And then that Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, it kind of becomes the foundation of Zen Buddhism. And for a while, they don't really care about other sutras because it's all about the Vajra Sutra. And so, you get the Zen, or again, Chan sect in China. We're off, and we're just going to use the Vajra Sutra. So it seems as if there was a group around the time of Nagarjuna who was using a different group of sutras. And they were saying, you know what? These are the authoritative sutras. And then that becomes the Madhyamaka and then that kind of becomes the foundation of Mahayana Buddhism. So I guess what I'm getting around to is I want us to be able to sort of read, read these sutras, but outside of the context in which we are finding them, if, if that makes sense. In other words, these 10 beautiful sutras, they are relegated to the miscellaneous category of the sutra. Whereas, I'm not gonna, I won't go get it, but the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha, those are the ones that are considered the most important. And you know what you're not gonna find a lot of in the Diga Nikaya? <laughs> stories about nuns. <laughs> you're gonna find a lot of stories about the great monks and all of that. And so I just, again, I want you to really be aware that when you're reading Buddhist sutras, in particular, when you're reading collections of sutras, be aware that the, the again, the order, the way that they're grouped, all of that indicates or points to kind of sectarian differences of these different schools of Buddhism. So... I just wanted to begin with that in case any of you were inclined to just take these 10 beautiful sutras and go off on retreat. I want you to know that there is a long tradition in Buddhism of doing that. <laughs> like that's how it works. And you know why it works that way? I just one additional thought on that. It's because we are so fortunate to not have a centralized Buddhist authority. You know, like the way the Christians, or at least the way the Catholics have the Pope, and these different groups have like these authority figures that say, you don't get to do that. You don't get to just take whatever gospel you want out of the Bible and go be, start your own church with it. I mean, people have done that. But my point is, is that within the world of Buddhism, there's nobody to say, don't do that. And that's what I think is one of the wonderful things about Buddhism that has allowed it to really morph and adapt to cultures, adapt to times and to change. It's because there's no central authority saying, no, 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 this is what the sutras are. This is their order. This is what 
you know, this is what they say in that sense. So I just wanted to begin with that note. Yeah, no. I have a follow up question that this is a very innocent question. So forgive it. But uh, like, is it then from what you're saying, I would conclude that it's not fair to say that the different schools of Buddhism, Buddhism, like, you know, Zen or, you know, Theravadan are, are equivalent to Catholicism and uh, baptism. And they're just not, it's very different. It's more like they're one of those groups or, well, maybe that's not fair to say either. <laughs> so I, I'm oversimplifying probably. But on that note, Noam, one of the things that you just don't find much of at all in the world of the history of Buddhism is conflict between Buddhist groups. You actually find, refreshingly, a lot of dialogue. In fact, different Buddhist groups get together and they debate, but not as a, like, a, we beat you, mm -hmm. but just as a matter of sharing ideas. So that also makes all of these different schools of Buddhism very different in that way. So, Noe, do you have a question? Yeah, it's just the idea of uh, a sangha, that, with that we become a sangha and we move forward. Uh, quick note, uh, my sangha came up with a name for itself, and, yes. and I, I, I suggested uh, crackpot Buddhist, but <laughs> it was declined. <laughs> But yes, indeed, Noe, that again, that's the way that Buddhism has functioned with kind of groups getting together either around a teacher or a sutra or a group of sutras and constructing a practice around them. And then that's the Sangha. So, okay. So let's go back to our uh, Bhikkhuni, the Bhikkhuni sutras here. So this is number four. And again, this is a nun, a bhikkhuni, named uh, Vijaya, which means victorious or the victorious one. <laughs> Very powerful name. So um, I also want to remind you from last week, the very first of the nuns, the very first of the suttas, it has the entire beginning. You know, thus have I heard on one occasion the Buddha was in Shravasti and Jetavana's Grove and all of that. But then after that, you don't get a repeat, repeat of that, but it's kind of assumed that it should be there. So this too takes place in Shravasti. And then in the morning, the Bhikkhuni Vijaya dressed. And then in this edition, it goes dot, dot, dot. <laughs> which we are to understand that means that she dressed, went into the city, begged for food, came back, had her meal, washed her feet, arranged her seat. And then she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. So for the day's meditation, <gasps> then Mara, the evil one, Desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the Bhikkhuni Vijaya, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse saying, You are so young and beautiful, and I too am a youth in my prime. Come, noble lady, let us rejoice with the music of a five-fold assembly. Then it occurred to the Bhikkhuni Vijaya. Now, who is this? A human? A non-human? Oh, this is Mara the evil one, trying to intimidate me, desiring to make me fall away from my concentration. Then the Bhikkhuni Vijaya, having understood this, having understood this is Mara, the evil one, she replied to him in verse saying, Forms, sounds, tastes, odors, and delightful tactile objects. 
I offer them right back to you, Mara, for I, O oh Mara, do not need them. I am repelled and humiliated by this foul, putrid body, subject to breakup, so fragile. I've uprooted sensual craving. As to those beings who fare amidst form, and those who abide in the formless, and those peaceful attainments too, everywhere darkness has been destroyed. Then Mara the evil one, realizing, ah, the Bhikkhuni Vijaya knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. Okay, so this is a good place to start to kind of get us going in that way. So the first thing, um, yeah, so the first thing to note is Mara, Mara's little poem. Oh, and by the way, I do want to remind you, the first of our nuns, Alavika, the very first of the nuns, I want to remind you that it was about her going off into seclusion. And Mara came and basically said, there's nothing, there's nothing to be found in seclusion. Like, why don't you go back to the city? Why are you here all alone? And, and then that nun gave her reply. So that one, it was about sort of this idea of sequestering or secluding oneself, it, it, you know, removing oneself from society in that way. And Mara was saying, don't do that. Or, you know, aren't you, you're missing something. You should go back to the city. And Alavinka was like, no, I'm not missing anything in that way. Then Soma, the second of the nuns, Mara basically said, what are you doing out here? You're a woman and a woman cannot achieve, um, you know, higher states of meditation and whatnot. And Soma says, you know, what does being a woman have to do with enlightenment? As far as I understand the Dharma, there's neither male nor female and all of that. Then Gotami, the last, the third nun, the one that we talked about last week, Mara came to her and was sort of taunting her, like, what are you doing out here in the woods? Are you, are you looking for a guy? You looking for a man? And so that was sort of, you know, I just want to point out that Mara is intimidating each of the nuns in a different way. In one, it's he's trying to scare her out of being in the woods all by the, herself. The other is trying to intimidate her in terms of her gender in that sense. The next is trying to kind of not intimidate her, but to try to cajole her by talking about needing a man in that way. And in this one, Mara is basically talking about this idea of you're so young and beautiful. And Mara says, I'm, I'm young and I'm young and in my prime too. Come on let's get it on <laughs> that way as Marvin Gaye says. And that, and I, I, I make that reference to Marvin Gaye and that joke because he says, come noble lady, let us rejoice with the music of a five fold assembly. Now, and if you have the wisdom publication, there's a footnote there about the five fold assembly. And it makes a note that in a different version of this sutra, the line, is actually about come noble lady let us rejoice with the music of drums lutes cymbals and there's four other or two other instruments that are listed so it's these five uh these five modalities i think it's like a stringed instrument a wind instrument a drum instrument and two others i forget exactly what they were but of course what mar is talking about is the five fold senses so it's kind of a really um interesting play of words or play of ideas there so but basically he's saying come on you're young live it up let's let's have a little bit of fun in that way but then vijaya she realizes oh this is mara trying to tempt me so the first thing is she returns with this idea of that visible forms. So 
just as forms, but they always mean visible forms, sounds, tastes, odors, and delightful tactile objects. I offer them right back to you, for I, Omara, do not need them. So that, of course, is like, that's pretty classic Buddhism there in that way, in terms of not needing or wanting or craving in a way the five sensual pleasures. Now, before we even, yeah, before we even move on to the next paragraph or the next stanza that's about the body, I wanted to say a couple of words about craving and desire, this idea of tanha. So what I want to point out is, is that I want to remind everybody that even though these are part of, you know, despite my disclaimer in terms of these being the, the Theravada Buddhist collection, regardless, these 10 suttas are from the more monastic, celibate, renunciatory path of Buddhism. And so there is this total renunciation of the world, which is to say a total renunciation of the five sense pleasures. Now, I could say a lot about that, which is the total renunciation of those. But I wanted to just say one quick word, just a, a quick word about the idea of craving. As, as householders, if you're a householder like me, there's something very important, I think, to keep in mind about the idea of craving, wanting, desiring, all of those ideas. You know, in Buddhism, the word is tanha. And it's always nice to know that the word tanha literally means thirst. But the Buddhists use that thirstiness to stand for all wanty, cravey, desiriness in that way. But the thing that I wanna point out about craving or desiring, let me put it like this. So if I, let's say, I don't know, let's say we, you know, we were hanging out, right? And I had a little, um, I don't know, a sweet, let's just say some, some candy. Like I had a bag of candy, but you sort of didn't, you don't know what it is. You've never had it before. And, you know, we're hanging out and I'm sitting here enjoying my uh, little candy treats. And I say to you, you want one? And you're like, sure. Like, I'll try one. Sure. And you take one of my little candy treats and you start eating it. And you're like, woo, this is yummy. This is good. <laughs> what I want you to know about that scenario is that you in that situation, you didn't have any craving or desire for my little treat because you had never had it before. So you don't know if you're going to like it or not. You don't know how you're going to feel about it or not. And so when I offer it, you know, I'm making an offering of food. <laughs> it would probably be rude, right, of a Buddhist to turn down an offering of food in that way. So you're like, sure, I'll try it. And then you eat it and it's you're delighted. You're like, oh, that's so good. What I want to stress tonight, just on this point, is that Buddhism, as far as I understand it, as far as I live it, as far as I teach it, Buddhism is not interested in you not enjoying that piece of candy. The thing about craving and desire, it's always for what we don't have. And more importantly, if you notice craving or desire, it's always about something that we don't have yet, but there's this idea that we could have it, and that's where, you know, where the wanting and the craving comes in. 
But what I really want you to notice is that when you are in a state of mind where you are craving or desiring or wanting something in that way, the mentality is, I'm not happy now, but I could be happy if I had that thing. And I want you to notice the way that when you are in that idea of like desiring or wanting that thing, you, by, by virtue of doing that, you are ruling out the possibility of having, of being pleased now. And what the way, the language that the Buddhists will talk about is the idea of contentment, the idea of being content, of being like, I don't actually need anything to be happy. I'm, I'm, I am now happy. <laughs> But notice that when one is in a mode of craving or desiring, it is this sort of, it's, again, it's this idea that in the future, when I get that thing, then I'll be happy. And as far as I understand the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, that's the whole problem, is that actually when we get the thing that we think is going to make us happy, it might make us happy for a moment. But then we're back to not being happy. And you know what I have done in the process of all of that? I've conditioned myself to think that I need that thing in order to be happy. So now through the process of conditioning, I have now really like done i've really restricted my ability to be content now because i've reinforced this idea that i can only be happy if i have my and you fill in the blank because we all sort of have different things that we might feel we need in order to be happy and i just want you to notice the difference between enjoying something <laughs> versus needing or wanting something and then getting it and enjoying it. Those are two different things in that way. And I emphasize this because, again, I think that Buddhism and the Dharma, as I often say, I think the Buddha wants us to be having a much better time than we're having in that way. But we keep sort of bumming ourselves out by these desires. And it's because we might not be noticing the deeper underlying psychology of all this, which again, is the idea that as soon as you're like, I could be happy with that, you are automatically saying that there's no way I could be happy now. Because I don't have that. I have now defined happiness as being in the presence of that thing. And therefore, when I'm not in the presence of that thing, I can't be happy. So for me, that's the problem with craving and desire is that it's a future oriented idea. So I just wanted to mention that about this idea about kind of giving back to Mara the forms, the sounds, the tastes, the odors, and the tactile objects. Questions about that? Everybody okay with that? That again, it is kind of a renunciant householder interpretation because a renunciant is kind of going for total neutrality in that way even any kind in that sense so the jaya sort of represents that that more re renunciatory path and along that line of the more early form of buddhism that's very renunciatory that's where we come to the second stanza she says, I am repelled and humiliated by this foul, putrid body, subject to break up, fragile. She says, I've uprooted sensual craving. So, I want you to know, I want everybody to know, if you read the Mahayana Sutras, and especially the Mahayana Sutras that are focused on the Bodhisattva path, 
there is one phrase that you hear repeated often, and it concerns the, the bodhisattva. And what the Mahayana Sutras say a lot about bodhisattvas, it says they don't begrudge the body. And that, that aspect of Mahayana Buddhism, which says, do not begrudge the body, it is in response to this earlier practice of Buddhism, which the practice was developing a disgust for your own body. Actually, it was about developing a disgust for bodies, others as well as one own, one's own. And what this kind of is tied in with, no, no big surprise, it's tied in with sexuality, which is that in the early Buddhist tradition, in the renunciatory path, a remedy for being sexually aroused was to contemplate that the object of desire, who, whoever's body it is that is turning you on, it is to contemplate that body of all the pus and the blood and the shit and everything that's inside of them. And it's supposed to make you turned off. I'm not saying it doesn't work as, an, as a technique. If you are interested in kind of suppressing sexual desire, it's a surefire way to do that. But my point is, is that early Buddhism was very negative regarding the body. And I want you to know that the Mahayana tradition recognizes that about the earlier path. And it says, oh yeah, we're not doing that. We're not doing the whole begrudge the body thing. And just as an aside, it's also part of the early monastic path to go to cemeteries and meditate on corpses. I want you to know that in Mahayana Sutras, it explicitly says, don't meditate on corpses. It specifically says that is reinforcing all the wrong ideas. So I just want you to know that it's one of the reasons why I'm more partial to teaching Mahayana Buddhism than the more kind of earlier path in that way, because I don't believe in uh, begrudging the body and I don't believe in the more morbidity of that practice, the charnel ground practices. So just want you to know that about, about this. Questions about the first two stanzas? Awesome. Now, the last stanza, it's a little tricky, but there's another poem coming up shortly that actually gives us a little bit of clarity or insight about this. So here's uh, Vijaya's final stanza. She says, as to those beings who fare amidst form and those who abide in the formless and those peaceful attainments too, everywhere darkness has been destroyed. So I actually find this really interesting because, again, if you read, I think it's, um, yeah, I think it, it's the nun named uh, Chala, but her poem concludes with a very similar stanza. And for me, Chala's poem clarifies uh, Vijaya's poem. So, as to those beings who fare amidst form. So, what that means is, or what that seems to be referring to, is as for those meditators that have transcended the realm of desire and are in the realm of form, what is called the realm of pure form. <clears throat> and by the way, if, if you kind of didn't know, to be in a dhyana or a jhana, to be in a jhanic state, traditionally is understood to be in the realm of four. That's what it kind of means. As for those who abide in the formless, those are those meditators that have transcended even the realm of form 
and are abiding in the formless realm. And traditionally, technically, a samadhi is a meditative state when you are in the formless realm. So that's normally the difference between a dhyana and a samadhi is whether you're in the realm of form or in the formless realm. Both of those, getting into the realm of form and getting into the formless realm, both of those elicit or produce what are being called here peaceful attainments. So these some they're called samapati, the ideas of attainments. An attainment could be something like nirodha. Nirodha means cessation. And so there's the idea of being angry. But when you get into a dhyana, the realm of form, where everything is very neutral because it's just about things in terms of their size, shape, number, like just real basic stuff, there's no particular room for anger. And so anger ceases while one is abiding in the realm of form. And the cessation of anger temporarily is a samapati, is an attainment. So she says, as for those people in the realm of form or those in their formless realm and all those peaceful attainments that they're getting, she says, everywhere darkness has been destroyed. Now, we have already, I think, uh, I don't know, it was a number of weeks ago, but we've actually already encountered kind of what she's talking about. You may recall that when we did the Samidhi, I think it was the Samidhi Sutra, it might have been the naked ascetic Kashapya, but we did a sutra not too long ago in which it was talking about how the Buddha, the Arahat, that all of the gods were looking for the Buddha and they looked all around the realm of desire, all around the realm of form, and even all around the formless realm. And they couldn't find the Buddha anywhere. And the, and the idea is, is, yeah, because a, the Buddha is fully in nirvana, which is to say that the delusion of self has been completely eradicated. And the idea is, is that when there isn't that sense of self, there isn't anybody to be in the realm of desire or the realm of form or the formless realm. So Vijaya is actually, as far as I read it, and I will explain why I read it that way when we get to the nun Chala, but I read that as her saying, yeah, all, all of you in the realm of form, all of you in the formless realm with all of your attainments, <laughs> good luck with that because I've destroyed all darkness, all the darkness of ignorance, which is to say, and we talked about this last week, Vijaya is an arahat. She is an arahat. So she has achieved this state that we are talking about. So that's why I read the conclu her concluding stanza is talking about how she is beyond all three realms in that way. All right. Questions, comments about Vijaya? Cool. So now we can go to Upalavanya. This is the one that I, I for me tonight, tonight is about this one. I, I really like this one. So not that I didn't like the Vijaya one, but all of the, you know, putrid nature of the body stuff, I'm just not into. So, but, so this nun <clears throat> is named uh, Upala, Upala Vanya, which means... Um, Vanya is like Varna, which means a, like a color, and Utpala, in Pali it's Upala, but it's Utpala in Sanskrit, which is the blue lotus flower. And we did, I did a whole Dharma talk one night, long time ago, on the blue lotus, the Utpala. So she was named, this nun was named Utpala Vanna because her skin was the color of a blue lotus. 
So a dark skinned uh, woman we are to presume, I would presume. Ooh, ooh, Upalavana, little background story on her. So two things, you know how <laughs> the Buddha has these two chief disciples, Shariputra and Matgulyayana, and Shariputra is the Shariputra, the wise. So he's like Vipassana, insight, realization monk. And Madhulyayana is the meditator, the shamatha monk. And Madhulyayana is the foremost in the use of superpowers. So Shariputra and Madhulyayana stand on the Buddha's right and left hand. Madhulyayana is the Buddha's left-hand man in that sense. But the Buddha is also said to have two chief female disciples. And Upalavana is one of the Buddha's two chief female disciples. And she is considered the foremost bhikkhuni in the supernatural powers. So Upalavana is the Buddha's left-hand woman in that sense. So we're, by the way, I wanted to give you that backstory on her being the foremost in the riddhis, in the superpowers, because it's going to play into her poem. Once again, we're at Shravasti. Then, in the morning, the bhikkhuni, Upalavana, dressed, went to town, begged for food, came back, and then she stood, not sat, but stood, at the foot of a sala tree in full bloom, in full flower. Then Mara the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the bhikkhuni Upalavana, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse. Having gone to a sala tree, with flowering top. You stand at its foot all alone, Bikuni. There is none whose beauty rivals yours. Foolish girl, aren't you afraid of rogues? Then it occurred to the Bikuni Upalavanya. Now who is this? A human? A non-human? This is Mara the evil one, come to scare me desiring to make me fall away from concentration. Then, the Bikuni Upalavana, having understood that this is Mara, the evil one, replied to him in verse, Though a hundred thousand rogues just like you might come here, I stir not a hair, I feel no terror. Even alone, Mara, I don't fear you. I can make myself disappear, or I can enter inside your belly. I can stand between your eyebrows, yet you won't catch a glimpse of where I stand. I am the master of my mind. The bases of power are well developed. I am freed from all bondage. Therefore, I don't fear you, friend. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing, oh, the bhikkhuni Upalavana knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. <laughs> okay. So the first thing that we need to talk about is Upalavanya standing, not sitting, at the foot of a sal tree or a sala tree, as it's called in Sanskrit. And that sala tree was in full bloom. <laughs> this is the this is the fun part about sutras. There's a lot of coded language going on in there. <laughs> so let's actually talk about the sala tree first. So the sal or sala tree, which is a 
a tree indigenous to India, it has a very kind of important uh, uh, position in the world of Buddhism. I would say for kind of two reasons. Um, you should know that in the in the story or the life story of the Buddha, trees figure very prominently. <laughs> and not just the Bodhi tree. Trees are very important within the world of Buddhism. And that the role of the tree, we see it first, even before the Buddha is born. Because what happens is, is when Maya, the Buddha's mother, when she's about to give birth, so the story goes, she went to this park called the Lumbini Garden. And it is said, it's part of the story, that right as she was about to give birth, she stood under a sala tree. And the sala tree actually lowered a branch for her to hang on to. And she used the solitary branch as a support when she was giving birth. Fast forward 80 years, when the Buddha passes away, he is buried between two twin solitaries. So the solitary is present at the Buddha's birth and is present at the Buddha's death. I'd say that's probably significant <laughs> in that way. But then we want to notice this. I, 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 I emphasized it that Upalabana, she stood under the tree. Now you might think because of the way I just told that story, you might think that's a reference back to Maya giving birth. I don't think it is. What I think it is, is you need to know that the, let's see, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but it's very interesting. So in the Buddhist tradition, the superpowers, these uh, supernormal powers, like the ability of reading people's minds, the ability of basically levitation, the ability to pass through solid objects, all of these different things, they're known as the Ridhis in Sanskrit or the Idhis in Pali, but the, I don't know, I, this is tricky, but the way, the way that you develop those superpowers, the Ridhis, is through what is called the Riddhipadda. Now the Riddhipadda, that word Padda, Padda means the steps the steps to developing the riddhis, the riddhipada. But what that means is, and I know this is getting like, whoa, wait, like you lost me already. But what happens is, is that within the world of Buddhism, the foot, like your feet, but the feet, the feet become synonymous with the riddhipada because you take the steps, it, it's all very poetic. But what I mean to say is, is that the reason why, or one interpretation of why she stood under the tree and didn't sit under the tree is because that's pointing to the Riddhipada. It's pointing to her feet in that way. These are things that you just start to notice after you kind of read enough sutras. But then there's actually one more clue to why this all points to her development of the superpowers. It has to do with the fact that the solitary was in full flower. And that's because you need to know that the development of a superpower is, so the way that you develop them is through the padda. But if you were to develop a superpower, it's called a fruit. It is the fruit of practice. And so the solitary she is under is in full bloom, in full flower. 
all of this is to say she has fully developed all the superpowers. So, so that's my interpretation of her standing at the foot of at the foot of the Sala tree that's in full bloom. Now, what is Upalavanya being intimidated with? Now it's being intimidated by being alone in the woods and this possibility of rogues coming along. So this is that idea of basically being all alone in the woods and this fear of, you, you know, take your pick, but this idea of being alone and then running into rogues or bandits in that way. So she says, of course, send them, <laughs> right? A hundred thousand rogues just like you might come here. I stir not a hair. I feel no terror. Even alone. I don't fear you, Mara. Just that, just that stanza is so powerful. Like we really need to appreciate who or what Mara represents in that way <laughs> and so for this person <laughs> to be so chill and to be so like even alone i'm not even afraid of you that is that is that's a, an accomplishment to say the least so now let's deal with her second stanza i can make myself disappear or I can enter inside your belly. I can stand between your eyebrows, yet you won't even catch a glimpse of me. So, of course, invisibility, um, penetrating solid objects like Mara's stomach, all of these things are classic superpowers, right? But I want to approach this a little differently. And what it is, is, I mean, we could talk superpowers all night. Everybody likes to talk about superpowers. It's like kind of such an interesting topic. But I want to kind of remind everybody of where last week's Dharma doors started to, we came to a close. And if I remember correctly, I mean, we were, it was a lot going on right at the last minute. I think Noam had asked a really good question about the mind and consciousness, and we were already talking about the mind and consciousness. But I want to remind you of the basic idea that I was kind of getting at last week before we ended. And what it is, is it's this basic Buddhist idea that the mind isn't a thing. <clears throat> but we can think it's a thing. And we think it's a thing in a few different ways. We talk about it in terms of my mind, and that sure, make, that sure makes it sound like it is something one can possess, <laughs> at the very least. But my main point from last week, it was that if, and this is totally possible, of course, if you associate the mind with the body, which is to say, if you think the seat of consciousness, if you think the seat of the mind is between the ears and behind the eyes, then it sounds like you think the mind is somewhere and it's very natural and normal to think that the mind is somewhere and then once we have made the presumption that the mind is a thing that must be somewhere it makes perfect sense to then say that it is in the brain but again it makes sense 
to say that the mind is in the brain if the mind is located somewhere. And it makes sense to say the mind is located somewhere if the mind is a thing. But if the mind is not a thing, meaning it's not a tangible physical thing at all, then it's not actually located anywhere. And if it's not located anywhere, it is definitely not located between the ears and behind the eyes. But what we are dealing with is a liberated freed mind like Upalavanya and a non-liberated mind. And the non-liberated mind thinks their mind is right behind their eyes. The liberated mind understands that the mind is not a thing, it's not located anywhere, and it is totally free in that way. So what I'm getting at is, is that yes, we could talk about like superpowers, like being invisible, <laughs> but I want you to think about this from a slightly less Harry Potter way <laughs> tonight. And I want you to kind of be thinking about it from a, a slightly philosophical point of view. And what that is, is now that we've established that there can be the idea that the mind is a thing and therefore it's somewhere and it must be in my brain or the mind isn't a thing and therefore it isn't anywhere and it is already liberated. What I want you to notice is that when we are in, when we are in the mode of thinking that the mind is a thing located in there, all of a sudden that is clearly a contributing factor to the mind identifying with the body. And when I say identifying with the body, I mean thinking, this is me, this, this is all me. But of course we talk about this almost every Sunday night, which is the idea that you could lose an arm and yet you would still be you and you would say, yeah, I used to have an arm, but now I don't have an arm. And what that proves is that the arm isn't you. And I assume that goes for the other arm, and I assume it goes for the legs, and I assume it goes for everything. So what is this you again? Like, and what we want to notice in terms of my two options here is that we can think of the self as this with the mind and the brain. And there's going to be a lot of consequences of thinking that. Fear of dying, disappointment about getting old, all kinds of things. But of course, I just walked you through this idea that the mind necessarily isn't necessarily a thing and all of that. But what I want to get around to is this, or what I'm trying to ooch us towards is this. If I, if my, if the mind were liberated and it was no longer deludedly identifying as Michael in this body in that way. So let's say that was the case and that mind was liberated. What, you know, what does that look like? And when I say, what does that look like? I don't mean, what does it feel like? I mean, literally then, what does that liberated mind look like? Is it male or female? Is it tall or short? Is it old or young? Or are all of those things, being old or young, male, female, all of those, maybe those are things that are about this. And what I'm getting at is, is that if you understand what I'm pointing to in terms of this liberated mind, it's invisible. So rather than thinking about it in a, in a Harry Potter way, in terms of like, I'm gonna make myself invisible. 
you could think of it as that liberated mind that is no longer identified with the visible body in that sense. It's an alternative way of thinking about invisibility is what I'm setting up here. That might not, again, might be less Harry Potter, but I don't want you to sort of just then dismiss this. Meaning I don't want you to dismiss our nuns' super abilities here in that way. The other thing I want you to notice in terms of the way that I set this up, I just set up how it is that you could make this kind of presumption that the mind brain con or the mind consciousness thing, you could think it is located between the ears and behind the eyes, right? But what I kind of want you to think about in terms of what we just talked about was that if it's just a kind of um, impression that one is under, an impression, a feeling as if you are behind the eyes and between the ears. Well, what I want to point at is, is that if everything that we've said regarding the mind not being a thing located somewhere, if that's kind of true in that way, then there's a way in which that mind already is in Mara's belly. It already is between Mara's eyebrows because it's not any more or less there than it is between the ears and behind the eyes is what I'm getting at in that way. Again, these are just alternate ways of thinking about the superpowers that are thinking about it more from the point of view of an enlightened mind and not actually cramming them into the artifice of an unenlightened mind, if that makes sense. Again, the unenlightened mind identifies with this body and therefore, when the unenlightened mind hears about invisibility, they think Harry Potter turning invisible. But it, it, I want you to notice how, yeah, that's because that's what you think the body is. But if you don't think that, then invisibility means something different. And a lot of things mean different things if you understand that the mind isn't a thing and it's not located anywhere. There's a lot more I could say about that, but let me pause there. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about superpower stuff? Yeah, Noe. Thank you. Uh, yes, interest, really, I love this idea, a story of a uh, soldier in World War II who's going to be executed, was punished because he put his hands in his pocket because they were cold and the captain pulled out, pulled out his samurai sword to decapitate him. And the soldier says, if you kill me, I will come into your body and live with you for eternity. And that stopped the superstitious. What a, what a great view. And it saved his life. It, it, that's what comes to mind is that ability to, you know, understand conditioning, if I may. <clears throat> Excellent example, Noe. Really great story to recall. That's a deep one. I hadn't heard that one, but that's a deep one as far as like, I, I feel like it, it resonates with everybody. It resonates with me as far as like what that would mean for that person to stay in their mind the rest of their life. Of course they would in that way, but that's a really interesting way of looking at it in terms of the co-dependentness of, of all that. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah, and one more, the, the last stanza of, um, of her poem is, I am the master of my mind. The basis of spiritual superpowers are well-developed. I'm freed from all bondage. Therefore, I don't fear you, friend. <laughs> I love that she refers to him as friend. Amazing. So 
of course, this speaks volumes, right? I'm master of my mind. The basis of powers are well-developed and I'm freed from all bondage. So I want to talk quickly about those, about being master of the mind and the idea of being freed of all bandha, bondage. So there's a Sanskrit word, which is bandha, but it's actually where we get the English word bondage from is from this Sanskrit word bandaha. So the main thing that I want to like emphasize is this idea of being master of your mind. So the way that I approach Buddhism, the way that I approach this, it has to do with, so, I always quote, I, I'm always quoting this sutra, not this sutra, a different sutra. So there's this Mahayana Buddha sutra called the Shramgama Sutra that I really like. And there's a really beautiful line in there. And the Buddha tells Ananda, he says, ordinary people are turned around by objects. He says, but the Tathagata, the Buddha, turns objects around. And that quote, ever since I first read it, it just clicked. And I've been, it's kind of been my go to uh, kind of quote in that way. So, in terms of what our nun has mentioned, in terms of mastering the mind, I want you to think about it this way I want you to think about the idea that. I, you know, and I don't know what it is because everybody's different, but I want you to think about a kind of, um, you know, it doesn't really matter again, because everybody's different, but it's about encountering an object or a person or hearing somebody like, it doesn't matter. But what I'm thinking about is having a reaction to something. In particular, I'm thinking in very classic Buddhist terms, which is being shown something and getting like excited by it and wanting and craving it in the ways that we talked about earlier in terms of not being content because you now want this thing. Or somebody showing you something and it either making you angry or making you afraid. And once again, is like, it's getting to you. In that case, if I showed, if I just showed you something and it affected you to the point where you got excited or you got sad, mad, or fearful, that object has turned you around. And what I mean is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, that object controlled you. That object like made you feel a certain way and you weren't even in control of it in that way. So I want you to think about that in terms of the ability of the things of this world. How much control do they have over you? Then I want you to think about this quote that I mentioned about the Buddha, where he says, yeah, ordinary people are turned around by objects, but a Tathagata turns objects around. And there's a lot of different ways that you can take that, the last part of that, the idea that a Buddha or a Tathagata turns objects around. One of the ways that you can interpret that is, you know, if, if I kind of showed you a picture, or better yet, let me I'll turn let me turn something around. I'll do I'll use this. So let's say I'm gonna use my my thing. So let's say I showed you this, and then I, you know, and, you know, I don't mean to be a little, a little lewd, a little disgusting, but let's say I had this and then I went like this and I brought it up and there was a brown spot there, right? And you were like, whoa, right? Yeah, 
oh. <laughs> so that would, of course, would be the object turning us around if we had that kind of reaction to it. Now, one way to turn an object around is if you have, let me put it to you this way, and, and forget about this, for example, for, for a moment. If you think a, a pile of fecal matter, if you think a pile of feces is disgusting, right? Well, you know what? <laughs> I think composting is beautiful. And what that means is, is that I actually think that fecal matter is amazing. I think it's beautiful. I think it's in, it's integral to the entire ecological process of the planet. Every time I go to the bathroom, I am grateful. It is wonderful to see shit in that way. And if you've ever suffered from constipation, you know what I'm talking about, that it is wonderful to see shit. Notice how you can just turn that around. Is shit good? Is it bad? Or is the in the mind of a Buddha, you just turn things around like that, right? So that's one way to, or one way that I would interpret that idea that a Buddha or Tathagata can turn objects around, whereas the ordinary person is just affected by them and turned around by them. But another way that I would interpret that idea If you see a roll of toilet paper, you've been turned around by this object. Because as I've shown you many, many times, it's a scarf. This is my very delicate scarf, right? And it's also my vase. It's a lot of things actually. And so my point is, is that to the unenlightened, ordinary mind, things just are what they are, period. To the enlightened mind, no, 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 no. <laughs> Anything is everything in that regard. And so I want to tie that idea together now, the idea of not being turned around by objects, but rather turning objects around. I want to tie that together with uh, our nun who says, I am the master of my mind. The basis of power well-developed. I'm freed from all bondage. Therefore, I don't fear you, friend. I want us to sort of just think about what that means to be master of your mind. To me, what that means is, is that the things of the world are not, that you are not at the mercy of the things of the world in that way, where everything is affecting us so. There's a way in which this enlightened woman, this, uh, you know, Upalavanya, our enlightened woman here, it's this way in which being master of her mind so that you know, Mara's sitting there going like, come on, like, aren't you afraid? Aren't you this? And she, no, I'm not. Because I'm master of my mind. I really think that that's, of course, you know, what Buddhism is going for in that way, that right now we are sort of at the mercy of the world, just being turned around by it. And it's just sort of like, like, for me, the way that I think about that is it's just kind of being like, like, ooh, give me that. Ah, ooh, ooh, ah, ooh. And we're just being tossed around by the world versus being still and calm and masters of our mind in that way. So that's my interpretation of what it would mean to be master of one's mind. And then, of course, the ultimate goal of Buddhism is to be freed from all bondage and the really important thing or a nice thing or something, it's to think about like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I've been actually 
setting up some ideas here tonight. I didn't even quite realize I was doing that. But in, to tie a lot of this together, regarding bondage, this idea of the bandha, what I want you to think about is this. It's about, let's take, let's go back, let's go back. Let's go back to what I was saying at the very beginning, and I was talking about this idea of craving and this idea of I'm not happy and content now, but I could be if I just had a glass of wine. It's all I need. All I need is a glass of wine. Then I'll, then I'll be happy. Very understandable. I get it. But again, a problem with that approach to happiness, that method of being happy when you have a glass of wine, that method works as long as there's wine. <laughs> as soon as you don't can't get that glass of wine, watch this. Not only can you not be happy, but you are now probably going to be a little angry because you don't have the thing that you have decided will make you happy. That's what the Buddha was talking about in terms of the Four Noble Truths, that the things that we think are giving us happiness, they're not. They're not actually giving us happiness. It's, it's a temporary fleeting semblance of happiness. It resembles happiness from a Buddhist point of view. So my point is that relationship, that idea with something as simple and kind of innocuous as a just, I just want my, my glass of wine at the end of the night to unwind. I get it. Again, I really understand it. But I just kind of want you to be noticing one thing in that. And it's an idea that I've kind of been putting together all night. It's the way in which we become bound to those things. We are in bondage to those things. And the thing about it is, if you don't reflect on it, you, I mean, you don't reflect upon all of this, the suffering, the cause of suffering, the craving, the clinging, all of that. If you don't reflect upon it, you could think that that glass of wine is your freedom. You that there could be a mentality. Believe me, I've had that mentality where the idea was is no, that's a I get to exercise my free will and do what I want with my life. I can be happy when I want to. Like there's all these ideas that to do that, just to have a simple glass of wine at the end of the night is freedom. And from a Buddhist point of view, it's actually bondage. And, it, and I want to make something clear again. It's why I made my, I tried to make my opening remark. It's about needing or wanting a craving, desiring that glass of wine. Like, I don't want to make this sort of about alcohol because I could have chosen anything or I didn't want to be kind of particularly Buddhist about it. But I feel like that example would maybe resonate with some people in terms of associating that with freedom and joy and like the best part of my day. Once again, what we want to notice psychologically is that if 30 minutes a night when we get that glass of wine, if that is defined as joy and happiness, what does that do to the other 23 and a half hours of the day? It turns those 23 and a half hour, uh, hours of the day, it turns them into being, um, well, not happy, not joyful. And notice how that works psychologically, that if you define happiness as those 30 minutes, you've done it in a, a compromising the other 23 and a half hours of the day in that sense. So 
again, I'm not trying to be a teetotaler, puritanical about alcohol. It's not about that. It's more about these ideas about, again, I think I want to come back and probably kind of start to wind down. I want to come back to that idea of the confusion about what freedom is. And I, again, I know, I understand that idea of like what we feel makes us free, but then it's about a closer examination of those things and noticing, am I actually enslaved by this thing? Am I actually bound in bondage because of this thing? So questions, comments, answers, ideas, Noe. I know I'm full of them today. <laughs> That's great. Um, Turning around, you know, turn, people are turned by things, but the Tathagata turns things. You know, I think of the sutras of language, of words, of, of, of how a word will turn me around, a phrase will turn me around. Texting, a texting turns me around because I can't read into it the inflection or the tone or, or you know, I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm going to be late. I'm like, it, it could be sarcastic you know also my brain just turns it into a lot of things yep i think that the saga that points to that view you know of, of language also being a hindrance and uh and the way we look at words and the way we look at language i the way i look at language when language hits my ears or my eyes that i'm learning to turn it around and going wow well, well, wait a minute i don't hear the tone you know i don't hear this it's, Thank you. It, <clears throat> plenty of opportunities for practice all the time. Yep. Other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Mm, just because we have a couple of minutes, let me, I'll mention one more uh, thing about the idea of uh, not being turned around by objects, but rather turning objects around. I, this is a, this is not entirely related to our sutra tonight. This is related to the other sutra that I mentioned, the Shurangama Sutra, where the quote comes from. But I think you, everybody will find this of interest. So I mentioned that you could interpret what the Buddha said in terms of turning objects around. I mentioned that you could interpret that in terms of sort of like, turning a negative into a positive. So that idea of being able to sort of make a bad, a good, a good thing out of a bad situation, uh, lemons into lemonade type of a thing, right? So there's that way. But then I took it to a kind of deeper level where it's actually about a conceptual level where we are locked into kind of rigid ideas of thinking about the world and we our minds are actually much more powerful and free than that and we could turn objects into anything they kind of need to be in that way so that's another way of understanding that but there's another way there's a third way to understand that quote of the buddha and what it is it's really simple but it's a it's a term or yeah like a phrase that i want you to be aware of because i know a lot of you out there are like serious dharma students in that sense so there's a phrase in the in the yoga chara the mind only school of buddhism and the phrase the the, the actually the whole project the entire path of the yoga chara mind only school of buddhism it's about what they call transforming the base or literally it's turning the base and what that is is it's like in a dream when we go when we go fall asleep and we enter a dream we are in a world of objects and in that dream we might see something and we go ooh gimme or we might see something in a dream and we go, ah, get away from me. And we run away. Now, in both those situations, 
the object has turned us around like we were talking about. We've gotten either excited or we've gotten fearful. But what we really want to notice in terms of psychology, it's about how I'm in the dream, but I don't know it's a dream. So I'm confused. I'm deluded into thinking it's reality when it's not reality. What we want to notice is, though, is that when we see an object in a dream and we go, ooh, I want that, that thinking perpetuates the delusion of the dream. You see how that works? Like, you don't know it's a dream, but as soon as you start tracing, chasing dream things, it's going to perpetuate your believing that it's real. So you're being turned around by objects. But when we have a lucid dream experience, we have transformed or overturned the base of our understanding, which is that we are no longer basing our thinking and our understanding on what we are seeing. We are no longer in a dream when we cease being turned around by objects and we realize, oh, this that I'm seeing and experiencing here, this is not the basis of my consciousness. And then that's what elicits a lucid dream experience when you have transformed your basis for understanding. And I kind of want you to know that for tonight, for this idea, the same ideas going on in this reality where these things keep popping up and we're like, ooh, give me, ah. And it's perpetuating a certain way of being in the world, which is a way of in which we are being tossed and turned by all these things. But you could have a transformation of the base and then that would be like a lucid dream but I call it lucid living in that way. And lucid living is the way that I think of bodhi or awakening. So, all right, that concludes that little Dharma talk on mastering the mind and all of that. We, uh, we have a few more nuns to go. So I'm gonna finish off the bhikkhuni uh, section of this next week and the next few nuns it just gets better and better so stay tuned for that <laughs> thanks everybody oh thanks 